Hello everyone, it's nice to see you. Uh, my name is uh, Eda Gural. I am the chair of the Department of Tourism and Hotel Management. Uh, tonight we are with uh, Somer Sivrioğlu. Uh, he's a graduate of us and at the same time he is a celebrity. I'd like to introduce Somer to you very briefly and then I'm going to leave the floor to him. Uh, he is born in Istanbul. Uh, Somer grew up around kitchens. His mom was a chef and restaurateur. So Somer knew right from the start, it takes a lot of hard work and passion when it comes to the food industry. He spent his first 25 years in Istanbul, Turkey, before moving to Australia to study MBA at UTS, then falling in love with Australia and starting his own Turkish restaurant, Efendi, in uh, Balmain, Sydney in the year 2007. Since it opened, Efendi became the custodian of Turkish food in Australia, winning several local and national awards. In the year 2015, Somer, Somer realized his lifelong dream of co-authoring his first cookbook, Anatolia, printed in five countries in three languages and winning the prestigious IACP award for the best international cookbook in the United States. In the year 2016, Somar opened his second restaurant, Anason, the first permanent restaurant to open in Barangoro, getting rave reviews and an award for the best new restaurant. In the year 2018, Somar was offered a host and judge position at MasterChef Turkey. In his fourth season, he continues with the program, recording over 300 episodes and ranking number one reality show on prime time for the last three years. And we are, uh, we are very proud that he is one of the graduates of our department. Thank you very much, Somar, joining us tonight. Thank you. Uh, very nice to be here yours. again. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Ada. That's a great um, start. You know, it's just I'm full of energy now. Um, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I won't go through much details as Ada did that very nicely, uh, nicely for me. But I want to talk a bit about my uh, my weekend career because I think I hope that will uh, that will have some relevance to some of the students because most of the followers of this uh, meeting is um, is is our students. So. They at least know about my career, so you know, they can be um, they can be hopeful for the future. Um, the reason that I want to mention my Bilkan career is not because it has been fantastic; it's been quite the contrary, actually. Um, I'm one of the few. I think I'm one of the few graduates that has been through every part of the every part of the ranking at the Bilkan University system. So I started with a satisfactory for the first semester, then I had a probation. And after that, I didn't give up the um, amazing nightlife that Ankara offered, and I had a repeat. And then um, it's still, I still didn't learn my lesson. And the following semester, I had a repeat prop. And just before uh, the year that I was going to be dismissed, like most of the Turks, I realized that this is not going to go on like this. And I had a distinction. So, <laughs> so, you know, it's just the threats definitely work for me, I guess. Um, and after that, uh, I had another satisfactory. And but the funniest one is the on the fourth year, first semester, we had the industry training, and I had the I had a high distinction in that. So you know, it's just like I really love. Um, there's a great um, there's a great cartoon. I should have put it into my presentation, but I didn't. There's a there's an elephant, a bird and a fish and the teacher is asking them to climb a tree. And, you know, and, you know, that is a bit like, you know, it's just because that you're not academically so successful, it doesn't mean that you cannot be successful in life because um, as soon as I started training, um, I knew that I really wanted to be in hospitality, uh, particularly I wanted to be in restaurants. And, um, you know, it's just like, I wasn't that much academically uh, academically talented, but I was pretty good in um, in operations part of the operations part of the system, and you know that that that, that has been that has been a great asset for me. And um, after I graduated from uh, from uh, Bilkent uh, for two years, I worked with my mom 
um, to open an amazing uh, restaurant and bar in Atakoy Regatta. And um, I was 21 years old and I, that was the first business that I failed. And I failed miserably because you know you don't give a bar to a 21 year old, regardless of how, how long education he has. Um, because you know that is the um, you are more interested in the customers than you are uh, with the you are with the product at that age. And um, so, but there's I think that is one of the best uh, apart from the Beacon University that has been one of the best education that I had. Because if you're ever gonna fail in business. It is amazing to fail at when you are 21 years old because you learn about it. You learn about your mistakes. It's not the amount of mistakes you make. It's what you learn from them. And I learned uh, a lot from those mistakes, you know, the everything to do with how not to run a restaurant. Um, and um, after that, because now I didn't have a restaurant um, uh, and most of my friends um, advanced their um, academical career by going to U.S., I didn't have that chance but because uh, my academic curriculum wasn't that good, but I was quite lucky that I got an acceptance from Australia. So I just, I just, I just went to Australia. So I just went to Australia in 1995 to do my MBA, as Ada said, to do my MBA in UTS, University of Technology of Sydney. And after Beacant, it was so easy. <laughs> in total, we had 16 subjects. So, you know, because I was taking four subjects in one semester, um, everyone in the school was saying, oh, you must be amazing. How can you do only four subjects? Um, but um, how can you do four subjects? That's a lot. And, um, and I graduated from that and I worked in corporate hospitality, corporate restaurant businesses. Uh, I started as a restaurant manager and then I worked with an um, Australian uh, restaurant company that grew from having five restaurants to 90 restaurants, including Italian, Spanish, Japanese, Chinese, um, modern Australian and Bavarian restaurants. And I managed that group. And I always thought like in the land of opportunity for restaurants in Sydney, in Australia, there was not even one good successful Turkish restaurant. So um, I decided to, I offered them at first, like should we open a Turkish restaurant? And they said, no, we don't want to do kebabs. And I said, well, it's not about that, but I couldn't convince them. So I said to myself, I said, I'll do it. If no one else is doing it, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it myself. And I pretty much put all my, um, all my money um, into my restaurant. And I opened, um, I opened up FND in 2007. 2007. And I'll start my presentation with that. Sorry. Right. I hope you can all see this. Um, and um, this is my first restaurant Effendi. Sorry. This is my first restaurant Effendi. We opened up in a really nice suburb called Balmain, about 15 minutes from, uh, from Sydney. And um, it became quite popular uh, because it was the first Turkish restaurant that didn't serve uh, ke doner kebabs. Um, and it was a proper restaurant with white tablecloths and really good service, really warm, uh, famous Turkish hospitality. Um, and then, you know, it became, it became uh, quite successful. Um, after, after one or two years of struggle, um, it became quite successful. And after that, um, in 2015, I published my first book uh, with uh, my good friend, David Dale who is an amazing food scholar and a, and a journalist. And we uh, came to Turkey and spent about six months in Turkey, traveling more than 30 cities with a photographer, Australian photographer, recording everything, recording our conversations and, and covering as much as Anatolia as we can um, and published our first book. And as Eda said, it became quite successful. It's been published in five different countries, in four different languages. And uh, we are going to do it in Japanese and anyone that knows me from MasterChef, you know how, um, how I admire Japanese culture. So um, I love seeing my book in kanji characters from upside down. So I'm looking forward to that edition as well. 
and um, that, I mean, that that that was that was great for me. It's one of my career highlights to have an internationally uh, renowned and award-winning um, cookbook. Um, after that, we opened our uh, first city restaurant in the bustling, really busy uh, Barangaru area. Anasom, it won the best um, new restaurant award the year that we opened, and it just went from strength to strength. And it's still, despite the uh, economic turndown in Australia, like anywhere else in the world, with the pandemic, um, it is still a very successful restaurant. And obviously, I had I've been offered a um, chef and judge position in MasterChef Turkey, and I jumped at the opportunity. And I've been with them for four years, traveling many cities in Turkey and helping to develop the uh, Turkish food culture and you know just getting it into the big messes and now the new project that i literally work on as we speak um i was at the restaurant this morning and we are building it up we are on the building phase opening up the kitchens trying new food and it brings back that 15 years ago i opened up my first restaurant at Fendi, and i would never imagine that one day i would open the same restaurant with a new concept as you can see see the logo has changed um, people who are watching this are pro pretty much one of the first people seeing this logo, by the way. So uh, a good surprise for everyone. Um, the logo has changed and we are opening our first restaurant in Istanbul in Levant, hopefully next week, if the snowstorm allows us in Istanbul. Um, and in the meantime, we are also working at a new concept called Tombik. Tombik is a kebab shop. So don't be fooled by the looks of the place. Yes, it looks like this. It looks like a really nice, funky city bar. But at the back, we have two uh, we have two kebab stations, and we're doing donut kebab together with drinks. So we are just changing um, changing that uh, stigma of donut kebab in the world, known as a cheap fast food um, fast food option where you go and grab uh, from that cheap and cheerful. We want to make that to um, you know casual, happening, and hip place. And this one is opening in April. So as soon as I opened up a Fendi. Uh, I'm going to get on a plane, go to Sydney, and open up our fourth restaurant. Um, this was about me, but let's now start talking about the uh, talking about what I'm here for. Uh, when Eda and uh, Bilkent University asked me to, you know, to talk about Turkish food and my experiences, I said, let's talk about, you know, wh what it was, um, what it is now, and what it will be in the future. Uh, what do we see? See. Um, it will be in the future. So um, that's what I'm going to be doing for you today. So the presentation is in three parts. Uh, I'll go with the history part quite quickly. Um, sorry. I'll go with the history part quite quickly because you probably all read about it. I'll spend a bit more time about analyzing what is happening now from my perspective. And in the end, just talk about how it should be in the future. Uh, what, are the, what are the challenges and opportunities for the future? Um, so if you look at the brief history, you probably know all of this. Um, so, uh, you know, Anatolia, uh, before the Turks arrived, the Turkic tribe arrived, uh, Anatolia, Mesopotamia is and was the cradle of civilization and agriculture. Hittites, Assyrians, ancient Greek, Phrygians, Lydians, Hellenistic, Eastern Romans, anyone, any character, any civilization in the ancient history, they have been through Anatolia. Most of them made uh, made it their home, and they contributed to the fertile land as we know, uh, the lucky land as we know, uh, called Mesopotamia. And we are on the upper part of Mesopotamia between uh, rivers Euphrates and Tigris. And what were they eating then? I mean, they had wheat. Uh, funnily enough, they had beer, uh, a type of beer that they produced from uh, from wheat. Um, and you can see that in the new um, in the new. Um, relics that are there that they are finding. Um, they had flat bread, um, ancient grains, obviously most of the ancient grains come from Anatolia. They had figs, they had wine, they had almonds, apricots, lots of fruits and nuts. So it wasn't, although it was really early ages, they were they were fed very well, you know, and they had they had really good food um, in in Anatolia. And in the meantime and then a bit later as well, the Turks were um, in Central and uh, Central Asia, which is the historic homeland for us, uh, you know, we were nomads. Obviously, we were 
on the horseback most of the time. Uh, we were not settling. Uh, we were just going from one place to the other and then living in the, living dominantly in the Central Asia. Um, because of that, we didn't have that much of uh, settlement food. We had more food to carry with us, uh, more to say, more travelers food, so to say. And that's why um, I never dwell into the arguments of, you know, what is Turkish, what is not Turkish, because it's a quite a short-sighted argument. And we will discuss that in the later part of the uh, presentation, why I believe uh, discussing the roots of a food, roots of food is quite uh, shallow. But there are two things that we can say, yes, definitely Turkish, which means that the Turkish tribes brought it into Anatolia and made it their own. And they are yogurt and pastırma. Yogurt, because they had fresh milk, they, they had small, uh, small cattle, uh, mainly sheep and goats, and they had milk, uh, but they, uh, by accident, uh, they fermented it and that became yogurt. So they could carry the milk without spoiling it uh, while they are traveling. And the other one is pastırma. I don't know if the legend is true uh, because there's a famous legend that said they said the riders will put the uh, put the meat, mainly horse meat, uh, under their saddle um, between the under their saddle and the horse, um, and then that will press it, and that's why uh, it's called pastırma. And that was the first pressed meat, and they can carry it with them for a long time uh, without having any issues of uh, contamination. Um, the other one is a mantu, obviously. Mantu comes from Central Asia. Um, you know, dumpling is a dumpling is one part of what comes from mantu, and our mantu is another one, and it definitely comes from the Uyghur Turks of the Central Asia. Um, they mainly ate horse meat and fermented milk made from horse meat called kumas, as you would know. Um, that was the main dishes that we had. But then we came to we came to Anatolia, and I mentioned already some of the ancient foods that we had in there. And then with the Seljukian era starting, they had most of these can be found in the ancient books, uh, burek, keşkek, halva, pickles. In the Seljukian era, we use a lot of pickling and all kinds of fermentation. Uh, yogurt, we brought it with us, but we already started making different types of, uh, different, different types of cheeses, uh, drying fruit, pretty much just using and drying everything we can um, in the, um, in the more fruitous uh, months uh, between spring and um, autumn uh, to carry, carry, carry us through the winter. Uh, Kataiki, for example, was already, already present in um, Sanchukyun era. And kebabs and meat and skewered meat and things like that, they all come from pre-Ottoman in Sanchukyun era. Um, obviously, what Turkish cuisine became most prominent, not only, um, not only um, in Turkey, but around the world, is was during the Ottoman era, uh, Ottoman era, especially after we conquered Istanbul and the Ottoman um, state became an Ottoman Empire, a world ruling empire. The Ottoman food in that time was pretty much the most dominant uh, food culture in the world, um, mainly because that we were the most dominant uh, empire in the world. Um, but there's one thing that we need to talk about. A lot of historians say the Ottoman cuisine is the basis of Turkish cuisine. Um, that, is, um, that is not entirely true. Yes, there is a lot of the Istanbul cuisine is the, one of the main forces of the Turkish cuisine as we know now, but, uh, and that comes from the palace food. That's unarguably that is right. But uh, the peasant food, the regional food uh, has no influence from the palace food. A lot of people talk about the palace was uh, producing food and it was giving it to the, uh, giving it to the common people, and you know when you research it and when you look at the uh, when you look at the food researchers um, and the historians of that time, um, that is not entirely true. Um, and the people that they are talking about is only the people living around the palace, and the number wouldn't be more than two thousand people. The domination of the that are that has been affected by the palace cooking. Even with that, the palace cooking, what they were giving it to the people were definitely not the, the luscious food that the sultans were having and sultan and sultan's family were, were having. I mean, um, from a very early time after the spice market is formed, um, you know, the, they had lots of spices. Rice was the predominant, um, predominant starch in the Ottoman palace diet uh, because all the Ottoman 
uh, sultans were really influenced by the by the Persian culture, not only with the food, but also the, the also the music, the poetry, um, the science, um, and they had a lot of Persian teachers. And um, so rice was cooked a, a lot in the um, palaces, but the people didn't have any rice because it was such a commodity; it was expensive. So they had bulgur. Um, you know, in the palace they were they had abundance because of the spice market. They could use a lot of different spices. Um, and that made the that make the Ottoman food quite a fruity with lots of different uh, different protein. Not only the not only the um, meats that as we know now, but you know they had lots of different types of birds like peasants and quails, um, any type of any type of any type of bird that you can think of. They had it. Uh, that's why the the Ottoman Sultan's kitchen, which is much smaller than the main kitchen in the top of a palace is called Kushane, because that's where they hang all the birds. But that was really reserved for the Sultan and the people living in the palace. Um, and, the, and the public didn't see that and they, they were not aware of that. So, um, but with the regional food, it was all about scarcity. I'm not talking about scarcity as it's a bad thing because I'm not, I'm not making a, a political argument in here saying, you know, I mean, it was like they didn't, uh, they didn't have good food. They have pretty good food because the scarcity creates excellence. Because when you have, when you don't have a lot of products, you know how to do that product very well. You know, when you have a, like a bowl of um, bowl of fruit, you know how to eat it fresh. You know how to work that, how to dry it. You learn how to make pickles out of it. You know how to make jams out of it. So scarcity sometimes is a great thing for development of food, and that be that became quite a. Um, quite a backstage for the regional food development in Turkey. That's why we have a number of um, dishes uh, from um, from that comes from that can only come from scarcity. I mean, imagine tarhana. You know, it's just like a yogurt and a wheat mixed and dried and kept for the winter months. If you were if you were if you were rich, you would never make a dish like that. And if you really look at most of our regional dishes. They all come from that mentality. They didn't have much, but they use what they have in very creative ways. So um, that's why I really believe that you know scarcity sometimes can be a good thing as well. And then now we come to the modern era. Um, you know, after the Ottoman Ottoman um, Empire affecting the Istanbul food, and then the regional food affecting getting a lot of immigration and influences from different uh, different cultures. Um, I didn't touch base so much on the influence. Obviously, in Istanbul, there was a lot of influence from the Armenian, Greek, Jewish, and all other cultures of Istanbul. And on the East, there was a lot of influence from the, from the Arabic cultures, Kurdish cultures, again, Assyrian cultures, Armenian cultures. So when we talk about Turkish cuisines, I'm talking about an encompassing cuisine. I'm not talking about only the people that came to, only the Turkish people. It's pretty much what was in um, in Anatolia at the time. So how do we look at it now? Like what is happening now? So at the moment, obviously, um, there is always a race between the tradition and innovation. And I will discuss this bit more uh, when we talk about the, um, when we do a SWOT analysis of our food uh, with the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. But um, obviously there is still a bit of tradition happening. But there is a lot of room for innovation. Not I'm not, not I'm not only talking about on a chef sense, but with the agriculture, uh, with the new method of cook, methods of cooking. Obviously, innovation is a big part of our um, culinary development. Another um, another issue that we have right now, and I will discuss that more when we do when we do our analysis, is the cultural globalization. Obviously, after Turkey opened up with the modern world. There has been a lot of um, global food uh, and fast food uh, came into the came into the country because of the way that we live, uh, because of the economy and everything like that. And then we have all the uh, big brands of you know fast food chains um, that came to Turkey when I was nine, ten years old. Actually, I remember that you know we were queuing up at the first McDonald's in Taksim for two hours just that we could get that. You know, amazing-looking, um, unique um, chips and a, and a and a bottle of 
uh, Coca-Cola, not even a bottle, the paper cup of Coca-Cola. And we were so proud that we could wait that we will carry that paper cup to the school and fill up the bottle of Coca-Cola into the paper cup and drink it from there. So, you know, this is great, like how you get affected by global marketing power of big companies like that. Um, and that became quite predominant in, uh, in the Turkish food culture as well. And then there is the geography versus ethnicity, another discussion that is a um, that we can pretty much dedicate a whole session on. You know, um, the one thing we always discuss, um, and the food scholars discuss, is you know, does the food belong to the geography, or does it belong, or does it belong more to ethnicity? I'll discuss this a lot more in one of the dishes when I'm in the last part of my presentation. Um, I'm going to show you the dishes that we do. And in there, uh, from one particular dish, I'm going to discuss, you, uh, discuss with you with the geography versus ethnicity of the food. My belief is the food belongs to the region that is grown. So it's predominantly influenced by the geography. Um, and that's why I don't really like dwelling into the argument of ethnicity of the food, because I find that quite uh, short-sighted. But we'll discuss on that more, as I said. So where are we now? In, in this one, I want to do a bit more, um, bit more in detail and pretty much having a very honest and open outlook to the Turkish food. What are the things that are working? And I'm looking at it from a global perspective, obviously. As the session says, this is from a chef's perspective. I'm not looking at it from a government's perspective. I'm not looking at it from a scholar's perspective. I'm simply looking at it from a chef's perspective. But the perspective that I have um, is quite global. The reason for that is... Um, I love one of my favorite books in my early um, adulthood was The Seagull by Richard Bach. And Richard Bach says that in Seagull, the higher I go up, the, the, the far away I get, I get from the ground, but the larger perspective I have on, the, on that ground that I used to live in. And um, this exactly happened to me, you know, being 15,000 kilometers away from my country, but always being interested in what is happening in here, and as a Turkish chef cooking in there, I had a very different outlook to the Turkish food, um, to pretty much most of the people working in it, because I was looking at it from an outside, you know, as in, as we say in Turkish, uh, um, like I'm, I'm not looking at it, I'm, I'm looking at it from a very outside, outsiders look really. But I, I traveled, um, I traveled a lot of countries, I cooked in so many different countries, and if I know one thing, I know what they think of Turkish cuisine. Um, when I do interviews and, and talk about our food, sometimes people get me wrong. And it happened to me about two years ago as well, when I said, you know, everyone talks about Turkish food is the third greatest food in the world. Um, you know, it must be such a secret because only Turks know about this. Um, this wasn't about this wasn't about taking a shot or on our food. I'm the last person who can do that. I earn my living from Turkish food. Uh, what I was trying to say is what the idea that we have in our mind, it doesn't exist um, in the real world outside. Um, but anyway, like if we go in there, we'll discuss this a bit more in here. So the strengths that we have, um, obviously we have deep roots to ancient cultures. The first part of the presentation was there for a reason. You know, I just wanted to show you that like we are living we are living in the luckiest land in the world. This is where the agriculture was born. This is where the civilization was born. There has not been a world dominating civilization at that time that didn't have a land in Anatolia. Istanbul has been capital to three world ruling empires. Um, so we are so lucky to feed from those roots. So instead of, um, instead of cutting those roots, we should just really work on understanding what it is. You know, we are looking at, um, we with, with Chatal and, and even newer relics, or older relics that are found now, uh, like Göbekli Tepe, um, our food history is going back 10, 11,000 years. So we need to understand it, we need to embrace it, and we need to pretty much just look at all of those cultures. Um, uh, and that is a huge strength because we can blend history with food, and we really have a lot of bases with our food. The other thing is obviously abundance. Um, I lived in so many different countries. Uh, you know, we don't have, there's not many, many uh, countries that you can find banana and tea and tobacco and avocado 
um, and uh, you know wild wild weeds and fish and uh, sheep um, and everything else in the same land and cheese amazing cheese um, in the same land you know we pretty much produce used to produce most of these goods most of these produces um, and that abundance uh, creates a very rich cuisine that we can all be proud and we can really use it as our strength. And the other thing is the regionality. Um, again, you know, it's just like we go, if you go and eat something at a traditional Black Sea restaurant, that will be so different, immensely different than what you eat in Gaziantep in the southern, southeastern part of Turkey. And again, a lot of countries don't have that, uh, don't have that luxury, we do. Um, you know, we have a culture, uh, dedicated to, we have a food culture dedicated to olive oil, and we have a food culture dedicated to butter. And, you know, so we can pretty much just have two different Turkish food experiences just with one cooking ingredient. And um, we are very lucky to have that regionality. And that is something we definitely play on in the world scene to bring the Turkish food into the future. So these are the strengths. What are our weaknesses? Food education is a big part of it. And I'm not only talking about the food education as we speak, I'm also talking about the, we started very late because it's all about recording. We started recording very late. Um, you know, Brillat Savarin recorded the French food in 15th century. Um, you know, before we started printed, they already, French already have a number of cookbooks that were published. And the earlier you publish and the earlier you own them, the longer printed history you have on the food. Uh, we started very late. Our first book is Major Tule Tabah Tabahin. Uh, I can never say that right. And that has been that has been printed in 19th century by a by a doctor. Um, um, so that created a lack of written history on Turkish food. We have a lot of folk stories, but not a lot of written print, um, uh, printed material, so to say. Um, and also coming coming up, um, up to recently, we only had one cooking school, thank God to Bolu Mengen. Um, and then from there on now we have uh, gastronomy faculties, gastronomy education. But you know, I visit a lot of them and I see, uh, I see a lot of them. So many of them are jumping onto the bandwagon, partly because of the success of MasterChef too, I have to say. Um, you know, when MasterChef started, we only have 35, um, gastronomy, um, gastronomy, fac not faculty or gastronomy, volume, whatever it is, I couldn't remember, sorry. And now we have about 88 of them. Yeah, well, now we have about 88 of them. Out of that, more than 50% don't even have a proper kitchen. Um, so there is the numbers, uh, but the education is still quite a bit iffy. And we also educate a lot still on the French techniques. There is not in any, I don't know, many good Anatolian uh, food education um, classes and systems. Um, and that's something that we need to um, we need to work on. And that is a definite weakness in our, to take in our Turkish cuisine into a global platform, in my opinion. Another one is what I call it the gastronationalism. We have the best food. Turkish food is the best food in the world. Uh, no one else does this better than the Turks. Um, they are great in Turkey, but it doesn't work in global platform. Um, people, we are like, especially the scholars, people who study food, they don't look at it that way. Turkey is the only nation that I lived in that defined their food as um, Turkish food and world food. Dunya Mutfa, world food, I haven't seen it anywhere else in the world. Like we will have, of course, that we should be proud with our what I have. You know, like in Indonesia, they have the Indonesian food. Then they have Chinese, they have French, they have Italian. Um, we are so egocentric or ethnocentric in our in our overlook in the um, in the food that we say uh, you either the Turkish food or the world food, um, as if we are in somewhere else apart from apart from Earth. You know, we are all in Earth. Uh, we are all in the world. So it should be named more international food. Even more so, it should be named by the countries. I don't even agree with terms like Asian food or Mediterranean food. That does none of them exist because in Asia, you got more than 50 countries that have all very different types of cuisines. So um, we need to respect other cultures to expect the same respect back for our culture. 
when I talk about gastronationalism, I also talk about micronationalism, which is all the cities. You know, I do this better than you. Um, you know, the Urfa kebab is better than Adana kebab. Um, you know, Urfa uh, does better chikofta than um, than uh, Adiyaman. Um, you know, who does the best lahmacun? You know, who does it better? Who does the best tandoor? Um, it's great for the cities and you know, or for the like a, uh, for the city morale maybe. But it doesn't really help in the global platform. I'll give you an example. We have more than 900 geographical locations uh, of food, geographical destination of food. We only have about seven or eight. I, don't, I didn't check the latest data. Seven or eight globally um, accepted geographical location of food. Um, we are so worried about owning certain types of food and produce for our cities. Uh, and we are not doing enough to own them in the world. If you don't record it, you lose it. Instead of arguing, why do they call it yogurt? It's Turkish. Record it. Write about it. Um, have some scholarly arguments about it, um, and then work, we need to work on it. Um, you know, otherwise we just is baklava Turkish? Is it Greek? Whoever recorded it, they record it. You know, so you we need to look at we need to look at it. By the way, baklava is neither Turkish nor uh, Greek. It comes from Middle East, and it's, not, it's one of those dishes that you cannot definitely put a national mark. If you ask me who does the best baklava, the answer is pretty much similar to anyone else's thought. Of course, it's Gaziantep, and I eat an any version of it. But as to who owns baklava, nobody recorded. So it's, not, it's, a, it's an empty argument. And there's a bigotry. Bigotry by bigotry, I mean, um, you know, that we don't think about it intelligently. Uh, we don't present it well. Um, you know, we still don't see um, certain products as part of Turkish cuisine. I'll give you the example of wine, for example. Wine is very important in developing um, developing a country's cuisine into an international cuisine. We have amazing wine. Wine is an agricultural product, um, you know, so we need to accept that. Uh, we also need to accept that we need women to get back into the cooking, um, you know, so we need more women chefs in the kitchen. So we need to look at it more openly. We need to understand what is happening in the in the world. We cannot just like you know close to ourselves and expect everyone to understand what our food is. If we don't open up, we don't accept people to to get in and to understand us. And we need to be accepted. We need to accept other foods. You know, a lot of my um, lot of people that I know they will need this or that or that because you know Turkish food is much better. We have to try try the food of different countries and different nations and understand it. Um, if you learn about it, believe me, the people from those countries will learn about our food as well. So that is another weakness that we, I believe we have. But what are the opportunities? How we can, how can we develop um, Turkish food and carry it into the future? Definitely the gastro tourism is still untapped. There are some really good, uh, there are some um, really good initiatives and NGOs like um, gastronomy Tourism Derni, and I work a lot with them as well. But before I started MasterChef, even during the first two years, I brought 20 uh, chefs and uh, food scholars and food writers into Turkey. And I took them to, um, I host them in Istanbul, took them to Gaziantep, took them to Edremit, to the North Aegean part, and then took them all the way down to Bodrum via, um, Bodrum via minibus. And they loved it. And they say, like, we knew about Turkey being a great tourism destination. We never knew about the gastronomic opportunities and how different it is to what we thought it was. Um, when we talk about gastro tourism, don't just think about, you know, um, the uh, Sultanahmet region of shish kebabs and köftes and things like that. Um, the vegetarianism, veganism, um, dairy free diets they increased more than 300% in the last 10 years. Um, Turkey is a vegan and vegetarian paradise. No one knows about it. Everyone knows us as a very predominantly kebab nation, really, which is not even Turkish. Um, so you can have a really healthy, um, healthy diet in Turkey. So it's great for the, um, great for the um, people with dietary requirements or healthy living. And when you talk about gastrotourism, we also need to talk about, you know, um, you know, about sports tourism as well. Um, you, it's really great for uh, for sports people 
um, our, our type of diet and the Turkish, good Turkish goods and groceries are great for them as well. So there is a huge opportunity that slowly we are studying, but um, in my opinion, it's still quite untapped, uh, the gastronomy tourism. Um, another opportunity is the international migration. I'm talking about the Turks migrating to all around the world. Um, the Turk, Turk, Turk, Turkish people are quite famous for being very, um, probably because we are still nomads, um, uh, being, being migrants. Um, you know, our dominance in Germany, in USA, in, uh, in Holland, uh, England, Turkey, um, in the Gulf countries, uh, there are lots of Turks living in there. And naturally, um, there, are, there are more Turkish restaurants opening. I've always been a big believer, not because I have restaurants overseas, but um, the contribution, but because I'm a chef, um, the contribution of Turkish restaurants to Turkish culture is a lot more than everyone else is seeing it. I host in my in my Efendi restaurant in Sydney, I host more than uh, 100,000 people a year. 100,000 people are eating Turkish food, speaking about Turkish food, and obviously culture and tourism. That is more than any embassy can do. That is more than any government organization can do in a country like Australia. So what do we need to do? We need to support those people. Um, we need to support the new chefs, Turkish chefs that are working overseas, uh, promote them to open up restaurants. I've never been a big believer of government should help us with that because in the end, you know, I'm an entrepreneur and I take the risk and I take the benefit in return if, I, if it's beneficial. But there's a lot that they can do and they can just support, even just as a moral support, um, that they can do saying that you are important. Uh, because it is very hard to do that without any uh, without any support from our motherland, so to say. Um, and I, I suffer for that. I don't need it now, to be very honest. So it's nothing to do with my own brands. I can do it, all of it by myself. But there are a lot of young chefs that still need that support. So Turkish cuisine can be one of those cuisines that are predominant outside of Turkey as well. Because that's a great tourism initiative for Turkish, for people coming to Turkey for tourism. Um, another opportunity is we have a very strong brand. Like, you know, some a lot of people know not much about it, but not of people, no one says, when you say Turkish food, everyone says yummy, it's delicious. Yes, there's a lot that they don't know, but it's a strong brand. Turkey and food has always been a strong brand. We just need to work on it. So there's a good opportunity. We don't need to say, do you know we have good food in Turkey? We need to say, do you know the variety? Do you know the abundance? Do you know the style of food that you probably don't think that you can find in Turkey? So, but we already have a very strong brand when it comes to branding ourselves as a um, world cuisine nation, so to say. But what are the threats? Obviously, global influence. We touched base on it uh, a bit. And I'm not only talking about the global influence that are coming from outside, also the global influence of what we are, uh, what we are exporting, um, you know, the kebab shops in the kebab shops in uh, Australia and in US and in La and London particularly um, are not doing us a good service. You know, it's just not, it's not what kebabs are doner kebabs are like in here. Some of the international Turkish brands are not what Turkish food is about. You know, so like the new restaurants that are opening up, especially in the Gulf region. Um, that doesn't define our food. I mean, I don't agree that that is, our, that is a part of Turkish food. So the influence that we are giving out is not right. And also there's a lot of global influence that are coming in here that might make our food um, seem less important. Another issue with that global influence, one that really upsets me is the, in the tourism regions of like um, Antalya, Alanya, Bodrum. You have more pizza shops in there than if, for example, in Bodrum, that you would have an Aegean restaurant, um, that a local restaurant. You have more burger joints in there than you would have a nice, um, nice restaurant that are doing Bodrum specialties, for example. And when you ask them, why do you, why you do this? Everyone says, this is because this is what the tourists want. They don't. No tourist wants to eat the same thing. They eat back in their home um, in a new country that they come. It's just because it's more convenient for them that they do it uh, because it 
takes a lot of research. It takes a lot of understanding. It takes a lot of fresh food principles uh, to cook Turkish food. And a lot of tourism, in a lot of tourism areas, we really lack that. And, and sadly, that is in the most predominant tourism destinations like Antalya, Alanya, and both. So that's another uh, threat of the global influence of we are trying to cater for the tourists that we believe that they want their pizzas and burgers. Obviously, another threat, not only for Turkey, but globally, is the agriculture versus industrial capitalism. Uh, the agriculture is the basis of Turkey. If you don't have produce, you don't have food. If you don't have food, you don't have restaurants. Um, so agriculture um, needs to be um, needs to be and the good um, good initiative agriculture needs to be supported um, and we can never lose that I mean, from a, we become from a nation that could pretty much uh, be self-sufficient with this agriculture and now we import a lot of products uh, I think Sumer uh, dropped uh, Sumer lost connection uh, Okay, let me. Eda hocam bizde de yok. Evet, değil mi? Somer düştü sanıyorum. Sanki evet. Somer, yes. Okay. İstanbul'da kar yağışma şimdi galiba. Hmm, evet. I think I'm back. Heh. All right, good. Okay, good. Ha bakmayın. Connection problem. <gülüyor> All right, we can continue. <gülüyor> İstanbul'da kar yağışı başladı da iyiydi bu. Ondan. <gülüyor> De, demiştik zaten. Bize daha önce öyle demiştik. İnşallah <gülüyor> o kadar kötü olmaz ya. Evet, sonra açacağız. <gülüyor> um, okay, Allah. I think I don't know. Did we talk about the we were talking about the threats? I think. Agriculture versus industry. Okay, lovely. Sorry about that. Um, let's keep on going. Um, the lack of cultural preservation. Obviously, a um, lot of Turkish. Um, Turkish uh, people that are living in the regional areas are um, are dying because they are getting old and we are losing some of those regional food. So we need to make sure that uh, we preserve that food and we preserve the regional food and we record it. And some cities are doing an amazing job. Gaziantep, Antakya, Adana, um, Afyon, they are doing great job in creating their own culinary Uh, books about their cities. So, you know, that is very different to what I'm saying about the uh, micronationalism. I mean, that is something we need to do and we need to share with people so that we can have that cultural preservation and the new chefs need to be uh, motivated by that and cook from their own region. So, so, What is future? We talk about you know what was past. We talk about what is happening now. We did a bit of analysis. So what is um, what is new? What is the future for Turkish cuisine? Um, I don't know how many of you follow, but in about four or five years ago, a, a, a new term called new Anatolian cuisine um, became quite prominent in chef circles. So what is it and what isn't? I want to talk about it. Um, in 2015. Um, My good friend and and uh, my contemporary chef Mehmet Gürs uh, was spearheaded the term New Anatolian cuisine, and pretty much as he started to open up, uh, open, he opened up Mikla, and his motto was to um, have the traditional Turkish food, but serve them in a new, uh, with new methods and new touch, and being open on innovation. So it's very important uh, with the New Anatolian cuisine that. Any chefs that are attempting to do that, we respect it and we understand the tradition. Like I would never do a traditional dish without understanding every detail of it. I will learn that from ustas and from moms, and um, and I will only after then I will um, start working on it and putting my spin to it because my spin and we all have a different obviously outlook to how should food should be for me. Um, as a chef that are taking the traditional recipes and serving it in a total different country, um, my mind works like, you know, okay, what is it now? And how can I make it different and hopefully better, um, but always respecting the tradition. Um, and the second part of it is while you respect and understand the tradition, we also need to be open and keen on innovation. So we shouldn't be afraid on changing it. O böyle olmaz is one of the worst things terms when it comes to 
um, innovation and developing Turkish food um, because you can cook it anyway. If it matches with it, you can make it. So it's just giving a different different life to it. It doesn't mean that you know you don't eat the original version. It says there's also this type of there's also this version of it. So um, that is very important to um, develop our cuisine and taking it to the future. We need to be mindful of the new dietary requirements. We need to be mindful of the changes in the um, in the food. We need to have a social responsibility of you know uh, making sure that our food is sustainable. Um, we have zero waste. Um, you know we we are respectful to the environment. We are respectful to the produce. So uh, we need to rethink about our traditional food and um, and thoughtfully change it using the um, using the innovation. So one of the biggest issues that we have and we need to change is that we don't really have a gastronomy policy in Turkey. Um, the, big, the I don't want to, as I said, you know, I don't want to just say the government didn't do it. Um, you know, it's but it needs to be part of it. And I say this in the program and I'll say it now. There should be a um, um, ministerial department within the Turkish uh, Turkish culture and tourism ministry. There needs to be a um, whatever they call sub ministry uh, for uh, gastronomy. And that is very important that, you know, and it needs to be someone that comes from the field um, and that's someone that has respected in the industry. And we need to have a gastronomy plan. Spain has it, you know, um, Norway, like all the Nordic regions have it. Peru had it. That's why these are all countries that we talk in the world on being dominating. Mexico has it. Um, we don't have one. If there is one, I haven't seen it. And I would love someone to share that with me so I can comment on it or I can say, wow, I've been so ignorant. I didn't know we didn't have one. So we are being very reactive to it. We need to have a five-year plan regardless of the political parties or anything like that. It needs to be seen as a master plan and it needs to be working on, as I said, regardless of any parties or anything like that. Uh, five-year plan is where we start. And also we need to have regional plans as well because I seriously believe the Turkish cuisine um, needs to be promoted as regional cuisines, not just saying globally, just Turkish cuisine, because the uh, Black Sea cuisine, every time that you say Turkish cuisine um, as a global cuisine, you almost disregard uh, Black Sea because uh, it doesn't have uh, it doesn't have the some of the popular uh, dishes we have globally, like kebabs and lamajos and things like that. So it needs to have a regional plan and regional development plans after we have the five-year plans. In it. Um, but it's not only the government, the NGOs, non-governmental organizations as well. Um, we have two restaurant organizations, for example, because I'm opening a restaurant now, I'm learning about it, um, uh, two main of them. And um, I asked them, look, you're both doing the same thing, like which one should I be a member? And one of them only accepts the restaurants that serve alcohol, and the other one only accepts the restaurants that don't serve alcohol. You know, that is not a differentiation. I mean, that is, you know, if you are a restaurant organization, don't make that political. It's a, you are a restaurant organization, and you are there to promote the sector, not the political agendas. And I'm saying this for the both parts. I'm not saying it only one part or the other. So it needs to be a body because the stronger, uh, stronger we are, um, the more say we have in our restaurants and in our in our um, Turkish cuisine, uh, carrying it to the future. And we can help the government with that. Um, you know, the chefs organizations are even worse. There are so many chef organizations. There are number of body of chefs organizations. And under that, there are more than 200 different sub organizations within those chefs organizations. There is not one encompassing chef and culinary organization in Turkey. You know, you talk to one of them and everyone is a Bashkan. Everyone is a, and we love it. You know, we are more Bashkans than members. Um, everyone is the, everyone is the head of their, um, head of their organization. Um, but we need functioning organizations that can have it serious say uh, without any agendas, just with the motto of taking Turkish cuisine, uh, carrying it into the future. Um, without those, it's, it's going to be very hard. You know, we can all talk about it but we need those organizations in place as well. So that's pretty much most of the formal part of my presentation, but I also wanna talk a bit more about what my understanding of new 
Anatolian cuisine is and what are the things that we do. So, you know, because it's much easier to um, show and tell than, than talk about it. So this is, for example, one of my favorite dishes that came as part of the new Anatolian cuisine from Mikla that Mehmet Yus created and it's been on his menu. This is called the fish bread. Um, if you ever been to Mikla, you can pretty much just see the Eminönü uh, balık ekmek stations just across the um, across from his place, uh, the fish bread. And this is his take on it with a really crisp uh, waffle and inside it is a very fresh uh, Çanakkale sardine. And what a great presentation. Um, and after he's done it, we everyone like Mahmoud, for example, he also did a fried Galata fish. So he's inspired, his restaurant again overlooks to the Galata and that one, his one looks to the Galata bridge. So he buys pretty much small fish from the, uh, from the uh, fishermen's on the Galata bridge and he cooks them and presents it in such a great form. Getting inspired, this is one of the dishes that we have at Anason at my restaurant in one of my restaurants in Sydney. And this also is called fish bread, um, you know, inspired by what Mehmet does. And this one is a raw fish. Um, uh, uh, it's a bonito and serve it, you know, serve it some black caviar on top and uh, in between two layers of uh, filo pastry. So there's nothing wrong with this. This doesn't say don't eat fish bread. Um, quite the contrary, it says, this is the way that I do it. So it has artistic liberty, it has innovation. Um, it doesn't discount the fish bread. It doesn't say, you know, fish bread is not good. It just says, this is what you can have it in a restaurant. Because truly, you can, we, we don't eat half a bread anymore. And, uh, you know, not every, if you want to taste more dishes, especially for restaurants like us that are trying to be uh, cultural custodians of, uh, of Turkish food, uh, I want you to taste, as, especially as a, you know, if you are new to Turkish food, I want you to taste many dishes from the Turkish food. So, you know, not only mine, but all three of them are uh, great examples of that. So I wanted to take it from uh, three restaurants that I admire, one of them being mine. Uh, and another one, for example, this had a lot of reaction from a lot, from a lot of people from Kilis saying, Kilis tava böyle yapılmaz. Um, and my answer to them has been exactly, I know it's not supposed to be this way. That's why I did it this way, because everyone, a lot of ustas, a lot of masters do kilistava and they do it brilliantly. But I do it this way. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm not saying kilistava is a, is a bad dish. Um, I'm going to improve it. No, I'm just saying this is the way that I do it. Because one of the dishes that I love as a chef living abroad in an, in an Anglo-dominated culture is shepherd's pie. And I believe shepherd's pie, the potato, and kebab goes excellent together because I think his pie has too much fat in it. So this potato puree absorbs that fat. So I'm not saying it's better, I'm saying it's different and we need to celebrate difference and we need to celebrate variety. Um, so yeah, I mean, that is one of the issues, especially if you um, if you use a, a culturally dominated dish like kilistawa, uh, the amount of hate mail I get, you wouldn't believe. Uh, but, do I care? No, I'll show you my menu for the new restaurant. So most of people will say, okay, I'll back off from it. This is what I do. This is a scorpion fish analı kızlı. Analı kızlı is one of the most traditional dishes that we have in our culture. While people are discussing if it belongs to Malatya and Gaziantep, I'm putting scorpion fish in this and I'm putting, um, and I'm putting um, uh, uh, Wongole into it from Çanakkale. This, every ingredient in this comes from Turkey, from different regions. Scorpion fish, my dad used to make a soup out of it. I think it's the best fish to use in a soup. It's sustainable. Um, it's not expensive. So it's quite, um, it's quite affordable for people who want to eat fish. And it makes an amazing soup base. And Wongole comes from Çanakkale and they're doing a really good job with it. So this is what I've done. And this is probably the next one that I'm going to get. Um, I'm going to get smashed over for taking a traditional dish and making it with a difference. Um, so this is inside the um, inside the mothers, uh, the big balls um, has some fish mince in it. And outside of it, it has the uh, bulgur köftes, which are the daughters. And, and then there's a really good, very rich fish stock with some vongole. 
I'm not saying it's better. I'm saying it's different. I mean, you need to celebrate difference. Turkish mess. This is a dish that I created in, in Australia. Eton mess, as you probably know, is a very famous dish that has been created in the Eton College. So the story is that they had a pavlova and someone dropped it and they created this, this dish from broken pavlovas. I've been approached by a um, Turkish cultural study group that they were doing an event at the restaurant and they said, can you do something that is uniquely Australian and turn that into a Turkish dish? And Pavlova is being very Australian, New Zealand, in fact. Um, I decided to use this. So pretty much only Pavlova is the only Australian contribution to that. Apart from that, I don't know if you can see it, but it has rose petals, pistachios from Gaziantep, um, and and a mohallebi instead of a cream over there uh, with some forest berries that to make it a you know, to give it a bit of a Turkish taste to it. So again, is it Turkish? No. Is it me? Definitely yes. Am I a Turkish chef? I you bet I am. So this is the way that I approach to it. But the one that I want to talk about a lot about this is Kadek prawns, um, and I think it's the last one on the presentation. Um, before, um, in the middle of my presentation, I thought about, you know, who does the, what does the food belong to? Does it belong to an ethnicity? Does it belong to a region? Does it belong to a country? This is Kadaif, Kadaif prawns. Um, I've done this at FND um, in my first, first year when I opened up in 2017. On top, there is Kadaifi wrapped prawns. Uh, Kadaifi is made by a Greek um, immigrant in Australia. The prawn comes definitely from Australia, obviously bring fresh fresh prawns and being a very valuable Australian produce. Under it is Mohammara. As you will probably know, Mohammara comes from Syria, uh, but it's quite prominent in Turkish cuisine as well. And the one that can make this the best in my restaurant is a Chinese chef. So if a Chinese chef is doing an Australian produce prawns, king prawns, uh, wrapped with a kadaifi that was made by a Greek immigrant in Sydney and served with a Syrian um, Syrian uh, muhammara. And the whole dish is projected by um, or idealized by a Turkish chef. Is it Turkish? Is it Syrian? Is it Chinese? Is it Greek or is it Australian? But most importantly, who cares? It's a bloody good dish. So we need to look at it a bit more this way and we need to celebrate our differences and we need to improve Turkish food uh, without losing the um, integrity and respect to the tradition, but without innovation, the only place to go is backwards. Thank you. That has been my presentation. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. So Mar, it was uh, full of information. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I wouldn't, uh, you know, adapt SWOT analysis to food. <laughs> wow. Well, you guys told wonderful. me about that. Sorry. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. It, it was so interesting. Um, now we can have some uh, questions uh, in the audience. Do we have questions? I saw Kaira. Uh, he was willing to ask a question, but I didn't want to interrupt you. Kaira, are you around? Do you like to ask your question? Uh, it, by the way, we have um, uh, Alliance members, Alliance by Institute for Bukus. Uh, we had uh, um, Maxim, I, I see Sa Sandra was around from Peru because uh, the Alliance has uh, members in 20 different countries. Uh, they, their students uh, are with us as well. So if you have uh, questions, we can ask uh, your questions to Amar. You can, so Amar, we, uh, we can, um, if you like, you can type your questions uh, to the chat or you can, uh, by raising your hand, you can ask your own question. How do you like to do? Hey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I have a question. Sure. Shall I, shall I start? Uh, as far as Mediterranean cuisine is concerned, uh, although we have the Mediterranean cuisine, 
but uh, Turkey is not, uh, you know, associated with that. Why is it so? Is it because of our ignorance? Uh, what is it? Look, Mediterranean cuisine is a um, culinary term that has invented in America. And uh, partly we are to blame for that because especially in America, because of the political pressure on Turkish restaurants. And that is one country that I always say, wherever you open up, open a Turkish restaurant, don't open a Mediterranean restaurant. But I understand some people, especially in LA, why they open up Mediterranean, uh, because there are, uh, they're, they're, they're, like, you know, there are people that are quite fundamentalist that they don't want in Turkish restaurants. In um, but I don't understand the Mediterranean cuisine because Let's look at the countries in Mediterranean, Lebanon, Turkey, Cyprus, Greece, Italy, provincial France, Spain, Morocco. Morocco. They all have amazing dominant food cultures. Like what is, there are commonalities. Yes, olive oil, olives, uh, smaller cattle, not too much of beef, but more sheep and goat. Um, I totally understand that. A lot of abundance of fruit, especially tomatoes, peppers, that which all came in the 18th century. So you wouldn't call it, uh, you wouldn't call it endemic Mediterranean produce. Um, but I don't understand the, I don't understand the um, uh, term of Mediterranean cuisine. A bit like I don't understand the Asian cuisine. Um, so I don't have an answer there, I, and I don't know. I mean, I think I think the Mediterranean region of Turkey definitely is part of the Mediterranean. Uh, Mediterranean diet and the Mediterranean cuisine, mm -hmm. um, but it is not something that we promote too much. Probably because the, the people in the Mediterranean region they are more affluent because there is tourism, so they rather stay in Turkey than more landlocked areas like the Central Anatolia or Southeast Anatolia that they do, they cannot find a job, so they have to migrate to a different country and open a restaurant in that. That's why kebab is quite predominant because that's the only food that they know how to make it. So. That's the only thing that I can say why Mediterranean uh, cuisine is not that dominant as Turkish cuisine in overseas. Mm. All right. Uh, I was, um, well, I, I found it interesting, you know, in the UNESCO's uh, World Heritage List, intangible cultural heritage, there is the Mediterranean diet, but there is no mention of uh, Turkey, but the others like Morocco. Mm. Um, Right. Uh, there are some questions. Uh, well, actually, there is one. Uh, like, what is the best restaurant in Ankara, uh, well, according uh, to you? <laughs> uh, look, I, I, I love I love Trilia. Trilia is one of my favorite restaurants, and I love what Surey Abe does in there because he does things differently. And if you probably get anything from my presentation. It is that I'm different, like I like doing things differently. Um, he did a lot of things differently in a fish restaurant that is quite a traditional style of restaurant in, for Turks. So um, I would say from what I know is Trilia, but you know, I'm definitely not a, I'm definitely not an expert on Ankara. I, I was about 25 years ago, but not now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think you like uh, seafood, right? So I love I... seafood, yeah. Mm. All right. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I think Kyra is with us. Would you like to ask your own question, Kyra? You were raising your hand. Hmm? Um, Kyra is a THM student. Hello, Kyra. Hello. Uh, so I wanted to actually ask about, so you talked about the nationalism aspect of hmm. food, where there is this problem of uh, that nationalism that actually is uh, a threat even to our uh, cuisine so like there is this um there is this narrative so to speak that uh, says that the greeks are stealing food from us like yeah. they're stealing uh food culture cuisine from us yeah. like how true is this because ultimately when we say turkish food we really talk about the very diverse ottoman uh inspired stuff actually mm -hmm. like how how much is Good and good stolen. Yeah. Um, well, you know, um, um, first of all, I mean, I, said, I meant more about the micro nationalism, which is the city nationalism. You know, like Gaziantep does it the best, Ufa does it the best. Yeah, yes. um, um, having a national pride is not something that I, you know, I'm against. You know, everyone should have, should be proud of where they come from. But it needs to be based on 
based on truth and not just by, you know, not just by empty arguments. So, and that is something that I get a lot, you know, so from, you know, the Greeks are stealing this, the Greeks are stealing that. They're not stealing anything. I mean, it's just like, you know, most of the Greek food um, culture has been developed by Greeks that lived in the Ottoman Empire, most of them in Istanbul and around. And then when they migrated to Greece, they were not celebrated as Greeks. They were celebrated as Ottomans or Rooms. You know, they were not they were not taken seriously as Greeks because they were not there. They migrated in there. But they enriched their culture so much. Like, you know, before, if you look at the Greece before Ottoman Empire, they didn't have that much of a variety of the food. But obviously, there's basis for them for them to own it because they cooked it in here, in Turkey. And then they took it with them because, you know, they were forced to go there and the Turks were forced to come to, uh, come to Turkey. I have many Greek friends and they speak to me in Turkish, most of them, especially the older generation. And they yearn being in Turkey. They yearn being in here. So the food is, the food belongs to who cooks it. And it belongs to the geography. So if they take it from here to there, obviously it's their food. So they, they can claim it as Greek. I can claim it, you know, um, you know, if one of my food, I cook it in Australia, it is an Australian food, you know, so because I cook it in there, um, as well as it's a Turkish food. So I don't see that stealing, you know, it's just, it's not something that, you know, it's an intangible product. You cannot steal that. It's like stealing a feeling, you know, it's just like, how can you, how can you steal it? But what they do good, and it's not only about Greeks, but what people, what other nations do very good is they record it. They apply for those certifications. They know how to do that. They write the books on time. You know, a lot of people told me, it's a very simple example. A friend of mine opened a Turkish restaurant and he put uh, muscle dolma into it, media dolma into it. And, and I seen it and I said, oh, in summer I'll do it as well. So I put it. And he jokingly said to me, he said, oh, you stole that from my restaurant because you've seen it in there. I said, no, it's in my book. It's written in 2015. We are having this argument since 2018. There is no argument. Be, uh, there is no argument back to this. I recorded it. I put that on the recipe. The publishing date is in there. So we have to record it. We have to apply for those certifications. Without doing that, we can just cry and say, they steal this, they steal that. So I see it and find it baseless. And there are ways to work around it. And they oppose to everything that we uh, we apply as well. We never do. You know, when they apply, when they apply for FETA, no, no one in Turkey, no, no one in Turkey even knew about it. So they got it. They got it. They got it passed. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, we uh, had um, uh, some um, audiences from the Hagahelia University. Um, Jari. Uh, he he was thanking you for this great presentation. Thank you. Uh, he was, it seems, a chef in the in the university. Then right. we have uh, Hande. Uh, I think it, uh, yes. All right. Uh, she has this question. Every profession has difficulties. What are the most difficult aspects of being a chef, and how do you deal with these challenges? Thanks, uh, Nidra, she says. Well, it look very, very difficult. It's one of the hardest things to do. Um, you, you, it's, it's very dangerous. You work with, uh, you work with heat. You work with hot water. You work with knives. You know, it's like being next to being working in a circus. You know, you got everything that can kill you, and you work with them. Uh, you got gas, <laughs> so you got everything that is in there. Um, you also have to be very careful because you can poison hundred people in one night. Um, you know, so food poisoning is a, and it can kill your business and, and you'll get into jail. You know, you can kill people or you can hurt people. Um, long working hours, you are standing up. Um, you know, we all have really long working hours. Um, there is a serious lack of understanding and appreciation in what a chef does. Um, so, you know, you work really long hours, but you don't get paid accordingly. And I'm talking about when you start your when you start your career. Um, and, you know, especially um, coming from Hande, it's, it's also especially hard for women because there's also, like in any part of, uh, part of workforce, um, there's always the, um, there's always a movement against, against women. They cannot be in, the, in, in an environment like that. 
um, which I find it really wrong. And I said that when I opened my restaurant, I'm going to have a, um, I'm going to have, I'm going to employ more women for my kitchen, and we we keep on doing that. Um, but like any job, it has challenges. But I would say it's very difficult to be a chef, and you know, it's a it's a hard job. But you know, I mean, if it is your passion, it's very hard to be an actor as well. You know, you probably don't get. I mean, for every actor that we see on screen, there are hundred actors that fail. So it's the same for the chefs as well. So, but if it is your passion, and if I know from myself, there is no other profession in life that I wanted wanted to have. So I'm very happy to be a chef. So if it is your passion, it is your passion, and I'm very happy that I I chose it. Um, and I'm very happy that I'll probably won't do anything else with my life. <laughs> very nice. Um, all right. There is also uh, Selin. Uh, how do you get the uh, inspiration to create new versions of traditional food? How do you um, get the inspiration? Inspiration is a funny thing. You get it from everywhere. I mean, you get it from a food stall. Like, you know, I was in Indonesia about four weeks ago. Um, and there was this food stall on the ground, you know, it's a uh, street food. They're making these coconut pancakes. And I'm saying that, you know, that will be great with like something we do, like with Katmar, with pistachio and everything like that. So if you are open, you get inspiration from everyone and everything. Sometimes you get it from a, from a song. Sometimes you get it from person. Sometimes I get it a lot from uh, moms and from like, like when we are traveling in Anatolia, I try to sneak into a mom's kitchen. I always ask, you know, who's the best chef in around here? And I go and I go and try to see them. I try to visit really traditional places, try to learn the trade from ustas, and then make it my own. So it's all about like, you know, how open you are to learn and to, um, and you know, things inspire. There are so many things around us. Produce inspires me. If I see a fresh prawn, like I, if I see a fresh sardine, then I say, oh, I need to do something with it such a great produce so it's all about being open i guess all right thank you uh Ayşe Güneş, uh wants to ask a question there's also uh, a another question uh here in the chat uh which one shall we go uh maybe uh Aysa, uh since uh Aysa, would you like to ask your own question yeah i would like to but I would like to first first start to say a big thank you to Summer. I don't have a question actually. I just wanted to thank him personally. Thank I got you. your book as a present from my sister who used to live in Sydney. I did live in Sydney too, but you <laughs> opened your restaurant after. Yeah, so I, I did have no chance. I was just looking at the pictures of the of the breakfast table. So I just wanted to thank you a lot. I got so many recipes from the book, and right now for May we are visiting Gaziantep. Do you have a plan? So I'm going to follow all the restaurants that you listed in the, in the book. So I'm so sure the, it will be a great Yeah, the, the best thing about Gaziantep is the restaurants don't change. Although the book is dated I six so. years. Yeah, like, you know, no, every but, restaurant that I put in there is still as relevant as it it's was. the same. Perfect. So okay. You can visit all of them. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Aysa. Thank you. Uh, Maria's question is, what about fusion cuisine, non-traditional hmm. cuisine restaurant in Ankara? Uh, maybe uh, in Istanbul as well. I mean, um, uh, fusion cuisine. Uh, how it, I mean, is it popular in, in Turkey, fusion cuisine? I don't see it very much. Um, um, I mean, let's define fusion because a uh, chef that I love always says, is it fusion or is it confusion? So, <laughs> um, I mean, if, you know, I mean, what we are doing is fusion, in my opinion, because we are taking a traditional food and then we're putting different elements to it. So, um, I don't know much about, I don't know much about Ankara, unfortunately. I, I, I, I don't go there as much as I want to. Uh, but in Istanbul, I would count um, Mikla and Neolokal and Turk for by Fatih Tutak, all as good fusion Turkish restaurants that. Take a, that take an idea from a tradition and put their own spin to it. So in my opinion, that is fusion. In Australia, we have a lot of fusion restaurants that would mix up, like you would go to a restaurant and you will have a hummus as a starter, and then you will have a, um, you will have a Chinese dish 
and you will finish with a French dessert. So maybe what we say in Turkey, the world cuisine is what we know as fusion. So if that is fusion, then I also like in Turkey, well, who does good international cuisine without borders, so without defining itself as French or Italian or something like that. I also really like Steve uh, by Ismet Sas in Istanbul. He's doing a great job. And I also like Sunset um, very well as well because they do international food, different types of international food very well as well, if that is fusion. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we completed uh, the questions we have. Um, uh, thank you very much, Soman. I may ask one more question though. Definitely. And, uh, of course, I mean, um, your heart is with the Turkish uh, cuisine, but uh, if you put the Turkish cuisine aside in the world, which is your favorite? Uh, I guess everyone that watches the program knows that it's Japanese. Japanese. Yeah, All right. Um, okay. Why I'm Japanese? Big... Is it the taste? Is it how they cook? Is no, it how no, they it's, uh, it's the mastery. It's how they do the simple best. Uh, mm. They don't they don't play around too much with the flavors. Uh, they just get a great produce and they work on it excellently. So it's more about the mastery of the cuisine than the um, than the mixed taste of it. So I love every part of Japanese cuisine. Japanese cuisine. All right. Thank you so much, so much. Uh, any other question? Do we have any other questions? I think these are the questions we have, and it is uh, almost nine thirty. Thank you very much, so much uh, for joining us today. It's uh, great to be with you. Thank you so much for your time, and we wish you all the success. We support you everywhere. <laughs> I know lovely. you do, and, and it's great to be back at school, and it's. I'm always proud to be from Bilkent University because Thank you know you, you got a it's not a, it's a lifelong journey, isn't it? I mean, I still hang out with people that are uh, with my teachers, and I still see my um, see my um, you know um, um, futures, and we hang out together and we talk about it. So I feel privileged um, to be back at my school that I love so much. Thank you for Thank you me. so much, so We are proud of you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. We wish you success with your new restaurants. Thank with you. Hopefully next week. TV show. <laughs> next week, yes, wonderful. Thank you so much, so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We had uh, friends from Peru to France and uh, Finland. We were quite international. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye-bye, everyone.